Good evening. Welcome to another edition of Newsmaker Live right here on DBS Television with me, Timothy Polio. As usual, we go up until 10 o'clock this evening and we conclude with the clip of that heat. We hope that you thoroughly enjoyed your carnival. Those of you who watched on television, those of you who went out and you also watched the parade or you participated in the various carnival activities and the various fets. I'm sure that you have been following the discussion on radio as well as on television, reading the newspapers and so on. And we've been speaking a lot about the so-called debauchery, the level of lewdness that was displayed. We seem to have focused almost exclusively on this, but there are other aspects of the carnival that we need to highlight. The fact that we had so many foreign nationals in St. Lucia, we had so many private feds, and most of the events, we are told, was well supported. And the organizers are currently reviewing um, the carnival, I imagine, with a view to ensuring that it continues to grow, it continues to appeal to a global audience, and we continue to record gains. Um, and definitely, that is one activity that will help in terms of uh, St. Lucia uh, marketing itself and diversifying the tourism product. I have a special guest in studio this evening to focus on the just concluded carnival and certainly the way forward. Well known to you, he is Dr. Adrian Auger. He is also an independent senator, economic development consultant, carnival band leader, that's the tribe of 12. And he has been involved in carnival production for over three decades. Welcome to the broadcast, sir. Thank you, Timothy. Just a little clarification. Mm -hmm. I'm not actually a band leader. Um, Tribe of 12 is a flat, mm -hmm. horizontal, consensus-driven um, organization. We do not have a hierarchy. Okay. Appreciate that, sir. Let us talk about um, the interesting aspect of Carnival. Mm -hmm. And topping that list will be, quote-unquote, the licentiousness that, in, from my perspective, dominated the, particularly the parade of the bands and so on. Um, how do you grade the level of um, lewdness that was displayed during our carnival this year compared to the other years that you have been involved in our main cultural showpiece? Um, okay, so to be honest, my, my impression of such things is secondhand. I did not see any lewdness in the part of the parade that I was in. I was focused almost entirely on my section which is Tribe of Twelve. So we might have seen a little bit of what was before us and, and immediately after us, but I did not see any excessively lewd behavior myself. Um, I did, however, see clips of things that were um, relayed via social media, and some of them were quite astounding and, in my view, crossed the line. Um, how do I see it in relation to previous years? I see it as a continuation of something that has been uh, a downward spiral in the society for some time. Um, I believe it's, it's, it's part of who we are becoming, that a, a place where anything goes, a place where um, you, know, you can do a little more and a little more and a little more, whether it is um, um, teething of public resources, whether it is um, bad behavior in the street, whether it is your mode of dress, whether it is your language, whether it is the music that you are singing on the stage every year, we, we, we push the boundary a little further. Um, and as a society, we're going to have to deal with that sooner or later. Do you think it has anything to do with cultural penetration, what we are exposed to by way of traveling, globalization, what we see on television? No, I think maybe it's, it's quite the opposite. I mean, we're, we're speaking about this for the first time, so it's not as if I have a, a theory prepared for you. Mm -hmm. I don't think it has to do with cultural penetration by other societies. I actually think it has to do with an increasingly libertine and risque and laissez-faire sort of approach to our own culture, our own development, our own um, sense of self, that we are increasingly without boundaries, we are increasingly without norms. And, um, and that seems to be the sort of freedom that we want at this particular stage in our development. Um, most societies which impact on ours, and, and that might be the U.S., um, Europe, rest of the Caribbean, I think are, are significantly more conservative than we are. And it was interesting to hear 
a DJ at the Remedy Fet, for example, saying to the Trinidad Posse of Women, it's okay to do what I'm asking you to do. If you're in St. Lucia, it's okay. And that struck me hearing it coming over the fence. I was at Pigeon Island at the time, um, setting up for, a, for an event. And it struck me at the time what exactly that message meant, that what you would not do at home in Trinidad, it's okay to do it because you're in St. Lucia and either nobody cares or nobody judges or everybody's into it. So that worried me a little bit as to whether that was in fact the reputation that we had. Um, the same, the same um, impression came across to me driving up the highway and seeing people coming out of hotels, and I'm assuming therefore that they were non-residents, all, all along the highway, people coming out of hotels at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, heading to parties in, in the most revealing of, 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 of outfits. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I stopped traffic along the, the, the Rodney Bay Road and, and said to the guy, hold on a second, I got to check this out because <laughs> this, this was absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the nature of dress that people had on, or undress that, that people had on going to, to a fete, I don't see, I, I can't say that I've seen that in Martinique or Guadeloupe, um, both carnivals I've attended there. So, you, is there, can we draw any positive from this? Are we evolving? Can it translate to down the road we will uh, benefit economically and otherwise from our new mode of behavior? Is there any, anything positive? Um, okay, so I don't want to come across as the as a puritanical prude or the ultra right Christian or any of those things, which I am not. But I have a difficulty um, trying to excuse um, a, a, a lack of boundaries with um, a potential economic reward that that somehow. If we make money from it, it's okay. Well, the prostitution makes lots of money. Why don't we just do that? And as a society, we had that debate many years ago when we spoke about gambling, for example. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was okay, and maybe it's come along, and maybe it hasn't impacted that much on, on anything. And, and maybe the ultra-right Christian community um, has been proven wrong that gambling does not cause all sorts of Sodom and Gomorrah to arise in your community. Um, but I, I worry a lot about... Um, the public persona of the country. And in that particular clip where the gentleman was inserting his face into the rare parts of, of, of a female reveler, um, if you look in the background, there's a child, and she covers her, her face in a sort of instinctive horror. And that's my concern. That's my concern. Um, what adults do in the privacy of their home or even in a, in a, in a private party which for which they pay and they know that they're going there for that sort of fun. I don't have a say in that. Um, but I think that what happens in a public place, in full view of children in particular, um, is, is another matter. And I think that um, people have a right, young people, innocent people, older people who are not into that level of behavior, have a right to view something that is otherwise beautiful and otherwise um, clean and decent and somehow reflects the values that they hold dear. And then if you want to go somewhere else with, your, with that kind of behavior, then, then, then you know, go do it. I mean, rent a place. Um, that's not my call. But I think on the streets, um, as in on the radio or on the television, um, there must be, as a society, as a civilized society, there must be some boundaries as to what is appropriate, what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. And even if we don't do it for ourselves, I think we have to do it for, for, for the children. Um, but do you think that um, our police officers, therefore, um, should have um, enforced our indecency laws? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you and I wouldn't be having this discussion because we would have already sent the signal that, hey, this thing has crossed the line. And while we are all for but a don't good you think time... We, the only thing we could have been saying to this evening that the police were overzealous. And, and maybe just the police were afraid of some kind of backlash. Remember yeah, what, what transpired just a few weeks ago over in Cicero, 
during some carnival activity. Mm -hmm. The police were trying to effect an arrest, um, I think two males or so on, and they were they were stopped. They were prevented from doing so mm -hmm. by revelers again in, in some yeah, but you um, can't have the rule activity. of you, mean, you mm -hmm. can't have the rule of the mob and expect to and expect to govern a society um, um, in, with any kind of civil order. Um, the police cannot be afraid. The police need to do what the law authorizes them to do, and then the matter goes to court. And then there are jurors and judges who will then say, the police were right or the police were wrong, the victim was this or the plaintiff was that, or, or the case is, is good or the case is, is invalid. So the police have to do what the police have to do. And if they perceive an act, which is a lewd act in a public place, then they, they act. That's what you're required to do. You're not required to be judge, jury, and executioner. You're required to enforce the law, which is you take the people into custody. Even if you don't take them into custody, but you encourage them to stop their activity, or you somehow hold people responsible for their behavior, um, and then let the, let, let the process of due law take its, take, take, take its course. Across the board, do you think it has something to do, and generally speaking, with leadership? at various levels, I'm mean, not talk, talking about primarily about governance and so on, but mm -hmm. leadership at the level of um, who is presiding over the affairs of our carnival, the private sector, the church in particular, um, because what we've heard over the last few days, one or two religious leaders mm -hmm. um, uh, voicing concern, expressing concern, but we do not even have an active St. Richard Christian Council. I think that's an easy cop-out. I think that's a too easy cop-out. I think at the end of the day, we have to take responsibility for our society, for our revelers, for our behavior. But somebody has um, to do it. Yeah, we have to do it. We, do, all, we do. all have to do mm. I mean, and sitting I don't here, think it. I don't think it will happen organically. Mm. Well, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I mean, certainly in, in our band, um, we understand it's Carnival Monday and it's Carnival Tuesday and everybody's going to have a good time on the road. And there are certain things that you won't do on Ash Wednesday that you will, you will see and you will be part of and you will even partake in it. Um, but if you go too far, um, the band as a group has a certain standard of behavior and somebody will just come to you and tap you mm -hmm. on the shoulder mm -hmm. and just give you a little nod and say, uh, mm -hmm. you're crossing the line, ease up a little bit. And that's all it takes. And, and we haven't had to do that in the band for, for, for the last, I would say, two or three years because we set a standard of behavior, which doesn't have to be the standard for everybody, but it's the standard for our band. And as a result of that, we get a particular type of reveler who understands that you can have a great time, um, but there are some things that we don't do. That's all. And that's do you all. do any kind of vetting? We don't do any kind of vetting, as in screening people and telling them, no, they cannot join the band. No, we don't do that. Um, I think that we have established the standard of the band so articulately that people know that they, they come there and they're safe and they're protected and there's a communal um, awareness that we are all part of one tribe, so to speak, and we are, we are our brother's keepers and our sister's keepers. And so if, if for example, a, a man was harassing a woman overly um, beyond what is normal, normal quote-unquote for carnival, then somebody would come up to him and say, look, brother, cool out. The, the girl not interested in you. Back off. And that's how we protect each other. And similarly, if there was a, a, a woman who was... I remember we were, on, we were on the stage one year, and I was doing the commentary live, the narration live, and this woman appeared from nowhere um, while the band was on the stage and decided to matter in front of the judges. And I was about to say on the mic, get that woman off the stage. And before I could even get to that point, um, and I was going to say it, no doubt in my mind about that, the, the elders of the band came forward from nowhere and they encircled the woman, blocked her off from camera view, and moved her to the back of the band and she was never seen again. Um, and that is the way people protect what they value. And this is the way that a society protects what it values. And so somebody could have stepped up and said at any point in time, excuse me, uh, not quite what we want to happen here. And we could all take responsibility for that. So you think there's um, a, a responsibility um, that should be shared by the other band leaders in terms of the behavior of the It's a responsibility that needs to be shared by all of us. I, I am not in the business of apportioning blame 
to the political leadership or to the agency or to band leaders particularly. I remember one day um, also right by the parish center, um, there was this older woman and she was whining on a little boy about five years old, maybe, this grown mature woman. I just went up to her and said, you must be out of your freaking mind. And I just pulled her off. That was my instinctive reaction as a parent, as a, as a citizen of St. Lucia. This is inappropriate. Stop it. I could have gotten stabbed, shot, mm -hmm. whatever, but, but I didn't think of that at the time as a self-preservation thing. I just thought that this is inappropriate for an adult to be doing to a child. And it brings me right to my point about um, look at the girl in the clip, the little child on the side of the road who instinctively, instinctively she knows that this is, this is offensive. Um, so there's good in us, and I think we just need to, to be more balanced about how far we go. But do you think we can over-sanitize our carnival to, the, to, the, ex to no, the extent that it will not be appealing to um, particularly Generation um, Z, young people, people from overseas, coming to St. Lucia to have a good time? I don't think we should over-sanitize anything. I just think that there should be a, a norm. There should be a standard. There should be um, an instinctive um, boundary where you can say to somebody, eh, just chill out a little bit, get sir. I mean, don't you do the same thing when you see your partner has, is on his seventh Johnny Walker Black and you see he's going to drive his car off a cliff? Don't you do the same thing? Don't you just say... Come, John, let, let me take you home or cool out, get some, sit down, drink a malt or something. I mean, that's the same thing that you would do. I don't see that it's any different because it is a particular type of behavior with a sexual connotation. Excess is dangerous for a number of reasons. And I don't see any reason why you couldn't just tap somebody on the shoulder and say, ah, enough, guess I'll just chill out, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but bon, I think that's, bon to do that that's not the mindset that we have right now, particularly, and I do not want to stigmatize, but particularly yeah. um, this current generation, our young people, in terms of how they engage in excesses. Young, I'm not writing off our young people in such a broad brush sort of approach. No, I don't think so. I think that, that young people are as sensible and as sensitive as any other generation. If they are not, then it is because they have observed a certain level of behavior which we have partaken in and said, it's okay. Is there a need to institute a code of conduct? By whom? By the organizers of Carnival. By the band leaders. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not in favor of censorship. I'm in favor of self-censorship. I'm not in favor of censorship by, by third parties. Uh, I don't think that really works. And I don't think it's going to serve us all that well. I think that... Um, People have to take individual responsibility. Stop blaming the government for everything. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I mean, or stop trying to blame the government for everything. But if, if people will not police themselves, because let's look at another scenario. Just like saying yeah. um, people should not engage in criminal activity. People mm -hmm. should not um, go out there and rob other people mm -hmm. and have illegal guns in their possession. Mm -hmm. They will not on their own. A lot of people who are just... Um, the, the whole mindset is that they must engage in criminal activity or in deviant behavior, in lewdness, in lewd behavior and so on. There must be some form of policing. But there That's is what I'm saying. policing. There is law and there is order and there are police who are paid and, and, and required and expected to act according to the law. And then beyond that, there is a system of trial by jury and, and, and sentencing and imprisonment and all the rest of it. So we have a system. The question is, are we using it? And even, if, and even if we saw something that was inappropriate as opposed to illegal, um, the police could, anybody, anybody, I don't want to single out the police, anybody could simply say, um, no, this is, this is not appropriate. Anybody, any mother could have said, I don't do that in front of my child. Any father could have said, don't, that's not what I want my son to see. Any father, any mother, any citizen could have But, but if they, the response is, I paid my money, and we've heard that, we keep hearing that, I paid my money to be part of a band, I can do what I want. Carnival is a time when you expose a, a, a lot of um, flesh. Yes. Um, definitely, you cannot tell me what to do. Well, unfortunately, I can refund you your money and ask you to leave. But I'm just talking about an ordinary member of the society. Somebody there was just watching the revelry and so on and seeing this is happening. There certainly would be a very hesitant in terms of um, yeah, because, uh, intervening. Because cowardice is easy. Mm -hmm. 
because cowardice is easy and taking a stand is difficult. And I'm going to get endless flack for every word that I've said here tonight, but it is what I firmly believe. And, and I think that we have to take responsibility as citizens for our, for our society. I mean, I don't expect everybody to agree with me. And I hope everybody does not agree with me because then we just be a pack of sheep. But we can have shades of opinion and we can try and also take a step back from any particular argument and say, okay, well, is that, is that, is that appropriate public behavior? And right is not equivalent to responsibility. You may have a right to do something. It doesn't mean that it's responsible to do it. You know what I'm saying? So, so it's a difficult issue. Don't get mm -hmm. me wrong. Mm -hmm. It is a difficult issue. And it's a difficult issue when we particularly try to make it the responsibility of somebody else. So the simpler thing to ask yourself is, what should I do about it? And if your answer is nothing, then that's your answer. My answer would be slightly different. The inappropriate behavior that you're making reference to, we understood that in the main would have been exhibited by mostly foreign nationals. Mm -hmm. Are you, are, can you substantiate this? I've heard that. I can't substantiate it, but I've, I have heard this, yes. And, and more, perhaps more plausible is the argument that the worst things were not done by members of bands, mm -hmm. but by members of the general public. Now, I've heard this, I'm not in a position to substantiate it, but I suspect that there's some truth to it. Um, so, again, do we hold band leaders responsible um, or do we, do we hold ourselves responsible? I think that if you, if, if Carl Tuesday, a man gets drunk and he's beating his wife on the side of the road, do you say it's Carnival Tuesday, it's okay because he's, he's entitled to have a few drinks and, well, you know, maybe she looked for it with that little bra top she has on her and he, she didn't. What do you do? Do you, do you say it's Carnival Tuesday, so it's okay? But you think, think generally that's, the society is generally turning a blind eye to a lot of um, illegal things, uh, things that are considered to be do devious? I think so? I'm just saying. Yes, I think so. Generally, think I'm so. just saying. I think so, and I think we're, we're at a stage in our development we are, where we are trying to decide um, as a society or as a, or as a multiple, multiple layers of society um, who's the enemy and who's the friend. And I think we come down as a, as a kind of hybrid, schizophrenic kind of society, which I think we are, because we live in this duality of, of, of right and wrong and language and, and black and white and, and red and yellow and all of these dualities. We haven't really sorted them out yet. And um, I think there are times when we're emotionally dishonest, when we're dis intellectually dishonest, and we, we come down on the side of the argument that's convenient at the time. Call it being hypocritical as well, being hypocrites? Maybe it's being schizophrenic. Let's go with that. Okay. Uh, yeah. No. I mean, maybe it's, we just haven't decided who we are. And, and maybe that's okay. But when Instagram blocks every hashtag that is vaguely related to St. Lucia Carnival, it's sending a signal to St. Lucia Carnival to say that the world out there thinks that there are some things that are beyond the boundary. Um, and therefore, we ought to be aware of that, that if we are going to be selling a product and using that as the excuse for all sorts of behavior, then be aware that somebody is going to impose a, a, a restriction on what you can and cannot show. And then you ask yourself of the, I mean, it's millions of hits that the Senator Carnival has, has had mm -hmm. over the season. Then you ask yourself, is it, is it worth having all of those hits to include stuff that is then going to cause you to get blocked? And, and when hundreds of St. Lucian sites get blocked, um, then you ask yourself, okay, do we need to take, a, do we need to take um, a cognizance of um, that boundary which exists outside? If you won't put the boundary for yourself, somebody is going to put it for you. Um, and you may not like where they draw the line. So you might as well police yourself. We'll continue the discussion in just a moment. And find out what came out of a meeting of stakeholders yesterday. Is hoping that Mr. Roger will be able to make some revelations on the broadcast. You're watching Newsmaker Live. Please stay with us.
Welcome back. Thank you so much for staying with us. Once again, you're watching Newsmaker Live right here on DBS Television with me, Timothy Polion, and my guest, Mr. Adrian Ogier. Um As I said earlier on, just before we took the break, that stakeholders would have met yesterday. What came out of that meeting, sir? Well, to be precise, um, it was the Carnival Vans Association who met with Event St. Lucia and the Cultural Development Foundation for a quick review of where we're at. I don't think it would be appropriate for me to just go into the detail of that meeting because I'm not authorized to do so and I'm only the vice president and there are other people, who, there's a PRO and there's a president who would be better placed. Also, um, it was a private meeting, but suffice it to say that um, it was a very good meeting. I think it was a frank meeting where we looked at um, responsive rather mm -hmm. than um, failures and shortcomings, where do we go from here, which is an appropriate question for all of us to, to, to contemplate. Um, it was a positive meeting, it was not rancorous, it was not negative. Um, um, the Carnival Bands Association was at great pains to point out that um, we've been down this road before, we've been here the longest in terms of the people in the room, we have um, developed rational and reasonable responses to a number of the issues that are being confronted and what we would really like now is for the authorities to take us seriously and to recognize that A, there is much work to be done, um, that CBA as a democratic organization operates by consensus and so there are certain things we cannot enforce but there are certain responses we recognize are necessary and we are looking to the authorities to, to exhibit leadership and collaboration and I think we are going to get that because generally there is a good, there is a good understanding both before Carnival and after Carnival. We had excellent relations with both CDF and events. The stuff that needs to be worked out is not rocket science. Um, with goodwill and good intentions and resources, which is always the bottom line, uh, I think we can move ahead. Uh, I don't see any insurmountable differences between the, the three organizations, and there's a lot of room for a lot of room for improvement. What we all recognize is that the carnival is at a crossroads, if I could use the, the, the very words of the um, chair of Event St. Lucia. <clears throat> and we need to make sure that this fantastic um, appeal that the festival has is channeled um, for sustainability and is harnessed for good, positive development. Um, there's a huge amount of collaboration with the rest of the region with artists collaborating, designers, musicians, costume builders, um, all sorts of people. I mean, um, I know of people who had their, their Tuesday wear flown in from London, from New York, from Trinidad. Um, so the Trinidad Essential Panel was getting a lot of attention, um, not least because of the music finding its way out of St. Lucia and touching so many people in so many parties and so many shows all over the Caribbean and beyond. So we're on the stage. Um, we have to decide now if we're going to mate to the world <laughs> or if we're going to present something else. But shouldn't we try to be unique, right? We, we need to provide a, a unique product, um, something that um, can identify with St. Lucia, something mm -hmm. that is truly St. Yes. And it, it's a general feeling that St. Lucians naturally um, they, they tend to be very licentious in terms of how they how they the department how they dance we're sexy and so people. on. Let's 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 <laughs> we are sexy people. Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. um, you know we are sexy people. It comes from our from our defiant mode. It comes from the fact that we've had to meander between two colonial powers for how many hundreds of years. Um, we yeah we we find our way through things. You know and we we are hybrid people. We 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 still don't recognize that we're in charge. We still think that there's an authority figure that we have to defy, but we want to be both conservative and licentious at the same time. And the carnival needs to find its balance. So if you want my opinion, it is that the it, there has to be both. There has to be both the, the sexy and the sensational, if you want to put it that way. There has to be both beauty and the beast. And this is why um, you had a certain rebalancing between um, 
the Carnival Monday and Tuesday, and then Ash Wednesday. These, these things provided balance. Everything, everything in life is about balance. Um, so there's the dark side and there's the light side. The dark side of Carnival is now in the ascendancy because the, the, the lighter side of Carnival is not. And if you rebalance the Carnival by bringing forward the beauty and the culture and the art of it, I think it will help to rebalance the carnival. But when everything is going 6.30 and there's nothing pulling it back, and this is where your pageants and your big costumes and your kings and queens and your portrayals have to rebalance the carnival. The balance so that you're making reference to, don't you think it would come at a huge cost and maybe um, these organizers are making comes. a serious sacrifice in that direction and therefore maybe they're compromising the product? Well, everything comes at a cost. Um, Sooner or later, everything has a cost. Um, no, I don't think it's a huge cost to, re to do the rebalance. I think it's a question of incentivizing the positive and allowing other things to have their way if necessary. But you're always trying. The state has a responsibility which is different to the responsibility of a private promoter. If a private promoter wants to have an orgy between midnight and 3 o'clock at Pigeon Island and they rent the place and they close it off and they charge three thousand US dollars per person and people want to go that is not my business but the state which is taxpayers money which includes taxpayers from the far Christian right whose taxes and tax rights need to be respected as well then the state has to take a more moderate approach to the business of the country and once you start spending taxpayers money then you have a moral obligation to make sure it is wisely spent and that it reflects some kind of moderate road between extreme left and extreme right. And this is why, to me, to, to address the difficult question of how to regulate the carnival, it is not so much to tell people what not to do, but to say to people, if you do this, there is a reward. If you do this, there is also something to be gained. There is also something to be recognized. You will be glorified for good instead of always being chastised for bad. And so if we can bring that balance back into the carnival by celebrating national themes, by rewarding people for um, positive lyrics, by encouraging the steel band, for example, which keeps hundreds of young people off the street and which has them practicing in pan yards for hours on end before panorama, if we can encourage mass camps, which provides... Um, um, environments where for young people, young men especially, and we can speak about that because we have young men in our mass camp from the community in which we are located who have come in to us and I believe, I would like to believe that the experience of working with elders, their aunties and their uncles, newfound and otherwise, it has transformed their life in some small way and showed them that there is other things that they can aspire to. So if we can build the, the Calypso art form, if we can build the, the writing of good lyrics, if we can celebrate national themes, if we can reinvest in the process of creativity in the mass camps, if we can bring a little bit more creativity to the Queen show, if we can support the pan, as I said earlier, there are things that will rebalance the carnival, and so it's not just a matter of sex and alcohol. There's a change direction. Nothing wrong with sex and alcohol. Yeah. There's a change direction. The chairperson of events, Inc., has deemed the city center not the best place to host carnival. Do you see the need to change the venue for the pageantry of the carnival? I don't. Um, I believe that the city center route needs to be rethought. And I think that the management of the parade needs to be rethought. Um, we are not doing well right now managing the flow in and out and around castries. I think we can do better. Um, if people want to change the route, then that may be well something to be considered. But my, my private view, my individual view, is that there's something symbolic about, about citizens marching down into the city. This is where the carnival came from. And although we have um, let go of some of the original trappings of the carnival, this is what it was about. It was about celebrating the freedom of the average, poor, black, um, um, former slave, um, under a colonial master to come into the city and take over the streets for two days. And that had a symbolic freedom to it. That, had, that was an expression of autonomy 
of 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 daring you know you can knock me down in your big white limousine because this is my day to be in the street and i don't know if you if you know what it is to 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 carry a costume um and and to come down a street obviously not. i don't you, know. <laughs> i don't know <laughs> you know, with a hundred other people mm -hmm. and know that you are virtually untouchable on that day that is a sense of celebration of of your right to exist your right to walk in the middle of the road your right to whine on a police in the crossroads you know th this is part of who we are this business of 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 taking two days to overcome uh, the normality if you want to put it that way but what we have to do is recenter the society recenter the community recenter ourselves and our own behavior following that and say okay that was then and we had a great time and now we got to get on with the business of life and living and earning and whatever else and and respecting and so forth but it's it's okay to break down the walls there's nothing wrong with that because there's a lot of walls that need to be broken down a lot of ceilings need to be shattered especially in a post-colonial society where you have stringencies about who is who and who's supposed to this and who's not supposed to that um and when you are done with that unfortunately or fortunately you have to start the process of rebuilding of renewal of rebalancing the, the, points, my, making, the, the points you're making there because i'm not much of a carnival person and so yes. on I'm, I'm getting the impression that um definitely that there's something that i just saw um and, and uh, inexplicable when it comes to carnival, when it yes. comes to how the, 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 the person who is deeply into the art form yeah. really appreciates it compared to other people who are on the periphery who really don't understand what it is to really be part of a band, to be part of the mass camp, and to have this kind of innate love mm -hmm. for carnival. You're right. Mm -hmm. um, and that is perhaps part of the loss that we have suffered over the years in the imitation of trends which we see in Brazil and Trinidad and elsewhere. Um, one thing that needs to be understood is that in all the nakedness and licentiousness of the Trinidad Carnival, the Trinidad government spends thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to ensure that the core um, resource, that the core wellspring of calypso and costume and traditional carnival and mass camps and kings and queens and 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 all of the traditional characters, um, whether it's blue devils, whether it's dragons, whether it is um, any of the other the mocha jumbies, those things are celebrated. They have their space, they have their day, they have their stage, they have their incentive systems, and the Trinidad government makes sure that those things don't die. So even while the party scene is evolving and is becoming less and less or more and more, depending on how you look at it, the Trinidad government is making sure that the, the origins of the carnival are preserved, they are understood, they are taught in schools, they are promulgated among children, and they are given their rightful place. On Carnival Saturday, Port of Spain closes down for traditional carnival. Okay, Kiddies Carnival comes through the city at midday. All right, it's given its rightful place. And, and the, the Junior Carnival is, is celebrated as fondly and as thoroughly, and it is upheld and it is sponsored and it is supported. It's given its place. So you have a balance between the part of the carnival that is evolving and the part of the carnival that stabilizes it and gives it its rationale, its meaning, its whole social context. Do you think that's why we're not able to invest in such um, events to a maximum level is because of the morass that we're in there and the, 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 the fact that we continue to say that we lack the resources, whether it is no, it's providing resources. quality health care, whether it's looking at uh, making gains in education and so on, and the art form and carnival and so on, the perennial excuse, again, is that we don't have the resources. But that's, that's not true anymore. So you see and, have, and you see you mm -hmm. see the millions of dollars we spend on the things that we want to spend millions of dollars on mm -hmm. you see it it's obvious it's in the papers every day it's in the media every day so no money is not the problem the problem is more likely management and the problem is also institutional so for example when event st lucia was created 
the idea was that it, it was not going to be a policy forming institution. And I thought that was unfortunate because who has the money makes the policy. That's the real that's the real reality of life. He who pays the piper calls the tune. Mm -hmm. And so there was a policy void. There was a big chasm between what the ministry would do, what CDF would do, what events would do, um, and to a certain extent, tourist board. And we did not rationalize where the policy concerning the festival would reside. We did not rationalize it. And so what we are finding now is that the policy has fallen between the cracks. And so the future evolve evolution of the, of the festival is, is left to whom? Who is it left to? Um, so I think that was a little bit of, of, of smoke and mirrors, that you would have an agency which would have a budget of millions of dollars and which would not be a policy-forming institution, is going to be a policy-forming institution, whether you mandate it to do so or not, because it has the budget. And the policy-forming institution on paper was supposed to be the carnival, the, the Cultural Development Foundation, but it didn't have the resources to call the shots. So that's a mix match right there. And we've been doing this over and over again with various um, artificial divisions between ministries. We did it with trade and commerce. Then we did it in finance and planning. Um, we've been constantly um, mix matching um, the mandates of our institutions. We need to, I think, go back and look at them and see um, and then why can't we also just make people accountable to themselves? We used to have a self-governing um, um, arrangement where the stakeholders committee had all of the major players, Steel Band, Carnival, uh, Bands Association, Calypso Association. Um, then you had the tourist board, then you had the Ministry of Finance for financial oversight. You had the private sector represented by the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and there were a couple other players, and you had a sort of self-accounting, self-regulating, um, internally consistent approach to the carnival. Well, then the minister came along and just disbanded that without so much as by your leave. And since then, we have been descending into chaos further and further and further each year because you have a mixed match of who does what and who's responsible for various things. Now, a friend of mine tells me that when I speak like that, people will stop listening because you keep telling them they are the problem. But um, that's for another show, as you say. How do you determine the success of Carnival? How do we gauge it in terms of its success, the financial returns and, and things of that nature? Because I think even St. Vincent just recently announced that they'll be making some kind of assessment yeah. of the Carnival in terms of what it is bringing in by way of uh, financial gains. Do you think that this is long overdue in the case of St. Lucia? I think that the that the carnival product has been undervalued for some time, um, and I say that based on the resources allocated to it um, not being measured accurately against the benefits that it generates, the economic returns. I don't think we've developed a tool for measuring um, just what the economic impact of the carnival is. So we tend to use proxies like um, arrivals or hotel occupancies. And because we're so tourist-centric, we believe that that is, the, that is the measure. We did the same thing for jazz. But for me, the measure of, of jazz festival or carnival is also, you know, whether the little boutiques in town are selling outfits for the white party or the red party or the black party. Um, it's about whether or not your seamstresses are employed making costumes as opposed to having um, everything imported. Um, there's nothing much to sew these days anyway. But um, it's, it's a measure also, are your mass men employed? Are they adequately paid? Are they making money during the season? Um, are your studios turning out and, and, and making a return? So, I mean, we don't own the tourism industry by and large. The tourism industry, the tourism infrastructure in the country is owned by people other than ourselves. Sorry, I'm going to get shot down for that too, but so be it. You can, you can dissect it if you want. Um, and so I can't measure the success of my culture based on hotel occupancies. That, for me, is only part of the picture. I would like to know that the Carnival um, Festival is working first as a cultural phenomenon, and, that, and secondly, that it has huge economic returns for participants. So it's going to be a mix, Tim. It's always, I think, going to have to be a mix. 
um, I cannot speak individually on that because I am both a mass person and an, and an economist. And so for me to be sensible, I have to take both sides of my of my viewpoint, my own viewpoint, which that it, it, it ought to be culturally sustainable, creative. It ought to be also economically sustainable. And I, I think there's enough room to do both. They're not in conflict. Have you just said when we can compare a carnival with that of the other carnivals in the region? Absolutely. Absolutely. To what yeah. extent? To the extent that um, we have a definable product, we have a date, we have a place, we have infrastructure, we have people, we have successive collaborations within and without St. Lucia, uh, people are coming to us. I don't think that, that a comparison is necessarily um, only validated by a ranking to say I'm first and you're mm -hmm. second and somebody else is third. I think that what you can say is that you're strong in one area and weak in another or you need to build in, in on this particular thing. Um, airlift continues to be an issue. Um, the cost of getting here is still pretty high. Um, do we have enough suitable accommodation when people arrive? That may be a question. And another question, diametrically opposite that might be, do we have enough pageant pageantry? Do we have a product that can be photographed, for example, that can go viral because it is absolutely beautiful, that it makes people um, feel not only above the waist but below the waist as well, um, or the other way around? Um, at the end of the day, we're going to have to differentiate. We don't, I don't think, maybe I'm wrong, maybe. I don't know, I could be wrong. Do we want to be just another event on the regional party calendar? Or do we want to have a St. Lucian carnival, which has something that is different? What, what is our strong, strong point, if you have any? Um, location. We have a great location. Um, we have warm and friendly people. We, we're not likely to get into fights over, over race, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we have an amazing amount of creativity in the country, uh, which pops up spontaneously all the time. Uh, the music scene is doing well. Um, maybe some editing to happen there, but that's another story. Uh, we have talented I'm, people. I'm sure some people might be asking, they wonder if he's talking about yeah. when you say editing, the Denry segment. Well, let me put because it to you. Because it's coming it's very popular. It's very it's popular. resonating with people beyond the show. So is Suicide by Graham McZone very <laughs> popular. You know, it happens almost every day, mm. but that's not the point. Let me put it to you this way. I was at the... Um, I was at the the Soka um, Monarch mm -hmm. show Power, Soka in, in, in Port of Spain. Mm -hmm. um, the year that that song came out, um, I ain't knock it yet, but I suck it already. Mm -hmm. um, and I looked and observed objectively the reaction of the Trinidad crowd, Trinidad audience to that song. And there was a restraint. There was a reluctance. Um, because it stood out from all of the other music, not just because of the beat, which was infectious and, 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 and valuably so, but because the lyric, in my view, and it seemed in the view of others, had just been a little uncomfortable mm -hmm. for the audience. And the reaction to that from St. Lucia was cautious at best. That was, that was my observation. Again, I could be wrong. But it seemed to me that people generally did not, they, they held back because they felt that the lyric was a little too explicit, a little too licentious. Um, and then the next artist came on and they were, they were lively again. So while people accepted that this was, it, maybe it was witty, maybe it was catchy, maybe it was quite rhythmic and infectious, there was a restraint that said, you know, maybe that's not that's a little too close to the wind. Um, I thought it was a valid reaction, first of all. I thought it was a valid reaction. And so we come right back to the question of um, do you draw a line and say, thou shalt not do this? Or do you simply say, look, there's a kind of, there's a kind of output that we are going to reward and there's a kind of output that we are going to allow to go its way. If it evolves, it evolves. That's up to it. That's the market. That's, that's the free market. But we, as a society, encourage a particular kind of, 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 of maybe um, wholesomeness, if you want to, you know, one of those vague, convenient words, mm -hmm. 
a certain, a certain wholesomeness in the things that are supported with public resources. Several decades after the change of date of Carnival from the pre yeah. period to um, July, um, how do you assess it? Do you think it has worked to our benefit? I think it has worked to our benefit, yes. I think that, that taking the Carnival out of the shadow of Trinidad was a good thing, and I would measure it in a number of ways, but perhaps most, um, most readily in terms of creative collaboration. We are now able to produce for Trinidad, and Trinidad is able to link with us. Um, our pen, pan men can go to Trinidad. Our writers are writing for the Trinidad market. Our producers are producing. Our performers are performing. Um, and vice mass versa. Mm -hmm. Yes, mass people are coming here. We are going down. Even the sourcing of, of material and um, for, for building of costumes and so forth, we can, we can be part of that market. Um, which produces costumes and purchases costumes for the rest of the region. Trinidad produces stuff for us, we produce stuff for Trinidad. So I think, from a, certainly from a trade of goods and services point of view, it's been, it's been good. What we, what we did not do is to define the, the, the artistic direction of the festival at the time that we moved it. So we presumed, that this is hindsight, nobody knew at the time or nobody thought at the time, but we moved the date and, and taking it out of its original pre lenten context, again, with the question of two days of FET, and then you had the, you had the pullback and the rebalancing of Lent. And so that kind of recentered the society. It recentered the carnival public. And there were things that you did, and then there were things that you did not do, and then you returned to a sort of a normalcy. When we moved the carnival out of that semi-religious context, we did not say to ourselves, okay, how do we preserve the artistic, the creative, um, the beauteous side of it, the, the, the things that made people feel whole and good and, and, and cause them to celebrate their freedom in a positive way. Um, we didn't do that. We allowed the carnival to evolve willy-nilly, laissez-faire, which is unfortunately what we do. Um, and that is a question of leadership. And, and Let's take a so, break. Mm -hmm. And so we Let's need see. to do that. Okay. Yeah. When we come back, we'll love to hear from you. So stand by to call the broadcast and uh, ask questions of uh, my guest, Dr. Adrian Auger, independent senator, economic development consultant, and he has been a part of the carnival in terms of its production over 30 years now. We'd love to hear from you when we come back. So please stay with us on Newsmaker Live. It's more like 40 years. <laughs> but you
Welcome back. Thank you so much for staying with us. You're watching News Maker Live right here on a DBS television. We want to pursue yet another issue, and that is um, the judging for the various carnival bands. And um, in the weekend issue of The Voice newspaper, you have the results of Saturday, July 20th as The Voice. Um, your bands, well, the bands seem to dominate, that is Tribe of Twelve. Um, section of the Year came in second. Um, you have also dominating Spirit of Carnival coming second again. Mass on the Move, Tribe of Twelve is number one. Parade of the Bands Individuals, Adrian Auger um, in number one. In number two, you have Quincy Pringles Griffith, also Tribe of Twelve. The Band of the Year, Tribute of Twelve. What is happening with um, with your band? Your band is dominating. Well, we're obviously working very hard and doing very well and seeing the benefits of our input. Um, I don't know what it is people want us to do, work less hard and produce less well and put crap on the stage for, um, for the audience and the, and the judges. I don't, I don't know what they want us to do. Um, we have demonstrated over the years a consistent approach to design, quality, portrayal, workmanship, um, these are the things that are rewarded. These are the things that are judged. These are the things that are evaluated. Um, and we do it very well. But and you think this aspect of the carnival is just not competitive? People, the other bands are just not interested in those traditional stuff? I don't think so, because if you look at the participation at this year's Kings and Queens, it was a record number of Kings and Queens. And I am very, very, very pleased to see that. Um, so I would have to say no, that there is a renewed interest, in fact. And I hope it continues. Let's put a telephone number on screen so that you can call right now with your questions and comments once again for my guest. Here is Dr. Adrian Auger. has been part of the Islands Carnival for a very long time, participated in carnivals in various parts of the region and indeed outside of the region as well. And he's one individual, I'm sure that many of you will concur, is very versed on matters relating to carnival. Not only, not only economics, but definitely um, carnival as well. So we are eagerly awaiting your calls and your questions and your comments for um, my guest. I'm sure some of you will say that, and, and I'm just being very blunt. So you might say that the judges just favor this um, carnival band, the Tribe of Twelve. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. You, and... Well, I'm asking the wrong person to respond Clearly. to this, you know, <laughs> but um, that is the reality. That is what you hear from time to time. We have a caller line. Yes. Hello. Good evening to you. This is News Make Alive. You're on the air. Hello. Okay. We lost that caller. Yeah. But, but go ahead. The, the point is, um, how do you respond to this? I think that Tribe of Twelve gives the judges something to be excited about. I think we show, we show tremendous respect for the judges in terms of presenting them with quality, with depth, with meaning, with workmanship, um, and we will continue to do that. Um, our other bands who wish to do the same are welcome to come and learn and listen. We have an open door policy. Anybody can come to our camp. Uh, we keep inviting young designers, young producers, young mass people, come and see. I am personally um, a little paranoid that, that we will stop one day and then the, the art will be lost. Um, so whoever wants to learn, please contact us. We will be happy to teach. There, there must be some downside to this when one carnival band is dominating in, in so many categories. Consistently well, enough. it's interesting that you raise that because, you know, Tim, I remember the days when um, Mass Action mm -hmm. um, won Band of the Year for 10 years straight and very often did quite well in King and Queen of the Bands. I remember also when Royalites um, used to win Band of the Year, King of the Bands, Queen of the Bands, Junior King and Junior Queen, Azizi Alexander, Asher Joseph, um, Marcia Tyson, Lydia Thibbles, Adrian Oje. Um, there happens to be a little common factor in in some of those stories um look to look to the look to the the people who are behind it look to the people who continue to work hard who have 20 30 and 40 years in the art i mean this does not happen overnight rituals was around for 10 years before we won band of the year 10 years mm -hmm. okay um there is a group of people who 
dedicate themselves to the making of mass, kings and queens in particular. And we work for, on average, six weeks or more, preparing our portrayal, researching, um, sourcing our materials. We rent a warehouse at great cost. Um, thank you to Caribbean Metals for giving us a roof over our head this year. Um, you know, and we, we take the thing seriously and we bring to the judges something which has value. We have a call. I don't think anybody can debate. Yeah, good evening. I want to make... Uh, good evening to you, caller. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I want to make a contribution. Go right ahead. I, this is one of the best programs I've heard on. I, I, I couldn't go to sleep on, on, until I say that. I know Dr. Ojo from the time he was... Before he was 10 years old. But I want to say some things. That the police... I was an ex-policeman, and I think we t deal too much with conviction. As long as we think of when offenses may be committed, with strict regards to decency, you try to stop the continual offenses. Mm -hmm. You can't stop it. You arrest. Mm -hmm. The court does not mean, no matter how you get them before the court, you can arrest them. You can exactly. summon them, or you can arrest them by warrant. Exactly. But as long as the offense is committed, you do your best to, to stop it. Yes. Now, I think, in this case, I think those people that commit yes offenses should be prosecuted. It's not too late. It's not too late. Mm -hmm. It's not too late. And if a thing is not good behavior, good behavior is disorderly behavior. It's disorderly behavior. And I, that's my opinion. I'm not a lawyer. And I think that we are we're not we deal too much with punishment as well. And we ourselves as policemen yeah. does not allow the law that we have. We have one of the best. Criminal code set we had. I am, I'm not thinking of the new one. I don't know much about the new one. I know, I know the one that Sir Lewis made, and I can tell you it was good. You have the first case is an idle and disorderly person. The second offence, you're a rogue and vagabond, and the third offence is the same thing. You're incorrigible offence, mm -hmm. and each one carries a different penalty. A person break a house for the first time. He has a, 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 a punishment. And if he breaks this a second time, he has increased punishment. And it goes on. And we did too much with the law. is not, not enough and all kind of thing. You go to England, a man break a house, you get six months. You want a, a man break a house, you want to give him 20 years his first time. No. I think we did too much with conviction. And we got to stop. Yeah. And the rest is the restraining of a person from his liberty in order that he or she shall be forthcoming in all uh, to answer to crime or suspected crime. Not, not bunking the crime. As long as you arrest a person lawfully and in good faith, nothing can happen to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the contribution, Thank sir. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So I think, well, mm -hmm. I think that's consistent with what we were saying mm -hmm. earlier, mm -hmm. that you don't have to necessarily worry about whether you're sending somebody to jail or not. You can stop. You can stop the behavior and indicate that this is not acceptable. This is not appropriate. Take it, you know, take it somewhere else, whatever. So it doesn't always have to be that you're locking up somebody because they did such and such and such a thing. It could just be that you're warning or that you're asking them to desist. Um, you know, you're not... You're not well, he's suggesting it's not too late to effect an arrest. I don't think we well, should be he going might on be right. <laughs> he might be right. I mean, if there, is, if there is evidence. But I'm not sure that that is necessarily um, the answer. Mm -hmm. it, it may be more important for us to send the signal that, look, we would rather this didn't happen again. That might be enough if that comes forcefully. And that is what we're going to have to do to get the accounts unblocked by Instagram. We are going to have to say to Instagram that we do not support this. We, would, we will try and for it not to happen again. And therefore, will you please let us back in? So why don't we just send that signal out consistently before the carnival. Why do we have to always be reacting and, oh my God, trying to save the day? No, let people know that there is a boundary for St. Lucia Carnival. You can have a great time, but there are some things which do not redound to the benefit of our society. Let's see if you have a call. We have a call. Good evening. News Make Alive, you on the air. Is Hello. That's what's on screen right now. That's what's on screen right now. Yeah. There you go. Hello. Good evening. 
Okay, we seem to have lost um, our call. But continue to call us once again. My guest this evening is Dr. Adrian Auger. We're focusing on the just concluded um, carnival. We are, we're focusing on the dominance, the dominant role being played by the carnival band, the tribe of 12. But let's take another call. Good evening. News make alive. You're on the air. Um, hi, Tim. Hi, hi. Good evening to you, ma'am. Hi, Dr. Roger. Adrian is fine. Yeah, yeah. I just want to congratulate um, Adrian Oje on some really good mass that he played this year and a usual thing that he does yearly. And I'm, I just want to say that without 12, if that's the new name of the band, I think it is, um, there would be no carnival but just my skin and, and feathers. And while the other bands are clamoring for prizes and who win what or whatever, they must realize that the judges are just looking at the same things in all the other bands. All they're seeing is just feathers on the first day, feathers and skin. And by the second day, there's nothing. And on top of that, the nakedness. So what is there to judge? There's nothing to judge but pure, pure nakedness. That's, that's just my contribution. All right, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. But you do feel, um, I don't know, it's a strange question anyway. I was about to tell you it's a strange yeah. question, but you feel like guilt that you're dominating um, all the major can categories <laughs> in, in Carnival? No, I, I, I'm sure we have this mentality to give somebody else a chance. No, you know? I don't do guilt. Um, <laughs> everybody has a chance in yeah. competition to bring their force, bring forth their best. Let's take another call. Good evening. Newsmaker Live, you're on the air. But Hi, I'd good like evening. Um, I'd just like to make a yeah. contribution yeah, and so. say um, hats off to you and your team, and Mr. Adrian Oje, for Thank bringing you. clean carnival to the masses. As I've seen, your costumes are tailored for a bit of a more matured crowd, mm -hmm. and we appreciate that. And I think some band leaders or members should maybe have some form of training under your watch to bring some clean carnival. It must not always be a skin bra and a panty to win the masses. As you've already seen on social media, and um, we have our kids that we take to see these um, events. And it really didn't settle good for some of our kids. And sometimes I hear they say on the radio stations that um, kids are meant to go to kiddies carnival. But, I mean, if we want to put St. Lucia on the map with regards to carnival on the whole, I think we could take our kids to see a decent adult parade. And this is my contribution. And, again, hats off to you and your team, Tribe of 12, and continue doing what you're doing. And I hope some persons within the masses, the youth, come forth and get a little guidance under your watch before it's too late. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. And, Tim, I just wanted thank the caller, well, both callers, for the encouragement. I also want to note that for the Independence Parade, mm -hmm. um, and if the caller would just hold, <laughs> for Independence parade, parade, we had 40 contingents on the road, hot sun, no alcohol, no licentious music. Everybody said it was one of the best displays mm -hmm. of St. Lucianness. There was nothing restrictive about it. There was nothing censured about it. People just understood that this was a celebration of a particular type. Um, and, and we were able to go down the street listening to only St. Lucian music. And there was no problem with the nature of behavior that was exhibited in a public parade on the same route going into the same city. So we are capable mm -hmm. of greatness. We have a call. Good evening. Thanks for holding on. You're now on the air. Tim. Good evening to you, sir. Good evening. Good evening, Adrian. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Very good. Tim, you see, the problem is that Adrian's band and all his exquisite portrayals, impressive portrayals, don't really make it to Instagram. You understand? Mm -hmm. And hence, you know, what makes it to Instagram is the negativity, and that is that gives, that explains the blackouts and what have you. And the reality is this, that the majority of young people will not join Adrian's band. Don't forget, this is a business, you know. They will, the, the majority of young people will join the bands that basically have maybe the more, more, more revealing costumes, etc., for them to express themselves. The carnival has evolved. And if you look at, if you look at carnival, it's not only in St. Lucia, you know. The costumes are similar from Toronto to Miami to, to coming down to the Caribbean. Everywhere the costumes are similar. You understand? 
And the unfortunate thing is that despite all what Adrian is doing, and, 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 and let me tell you something, I'm very happy that you see Adrian himself is protecting that aspect of carnival, the traditional masks, the portrayals, the, the, the costumes, the, 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 the art. I mean, and, the, the, but people do not pay attention to this thing. They rather share face, a man facing a woman bum bum. That is what is, is, is making our carnival look, look bad. And I want Adrian to, con, con, um, to comment on the, the negativity. And that is the society that we live in, you know. Negativity taking pre precedence over the positivity, you know. So, I mean, I'd like to comment, Adrian. I would, I would like to say, well, look, yes, of course, you know, I want him to continue in that vein. I think that's what, you know, that's what we want to see out there, you know, but we don't see that out there. And that, that, that's the reality. All right, sir. Thank you so much. Adrian? I think the caller said it all. I don't know. Um, um, I, I agree, and I'm, I thank him for his comments. Yeah, cool. Maybe we need to do more to project that side of the con. Maybe we need to take responsibility as a band for projecting ourselves more into the, into the, 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 the global um, social media space. Maybe that's part of our responsibility as well. We have a call. Good evening. Newsmaker Live, you're on the air. Hi, good evening to you, sir. Um, well, Adrian knows who's speaking. I'm sure you recognize my voice. But I, I kind of find it um, strange why all the media seems to be on this thing about, you know, Adrian's winning all the time and it's a discouragement. Um, I jumped Carnival many years ago. I haven't got back into it. But after watching this year, I think I will. Um, but, you know, you look at Diamond Steel winning all the time. And to me, when it comes to the competitive aspect, it just encourages people to say that we let's dethrone these guys, you know, let's, let's try and rise to the level and take them out. But I think my main issue with, with Carnival is, as somebody that used to play Mass and somebody used to watch Mass, I always looked at Carnival as the creativity and then for me it was building the King costumes and seeing your work go across stage and then finally... The, the the final jump up will be the release after all of the hard work. Mm -hmm. And you just look at, you know, the lack of that kind of creativity, lack of that kind of vibe, and you realize that, you know, it's changed in the sense that nobody really cares about that aspect of it from the other bands. And what really hurts me is that, you know, you look at Carnival from a distance, and it could be it might as well look just like a protest match when some of these bands are coming down because you don't even see colors, you don't even see sections. I mean, trust me, we used to get on just as bad as these guys did, but we didn't do it, you know, with everything exposed, but we would have our fun, but then we would stay organized, we would look good, we would put on a show, which wasn't about vulgarity, it was about color, it was about creativity, it was about, you know, organization. Thank you. All right, sir. Um, Thank you so, so much for calling. I think, again, he's touching on the question of balance, and he said the release after all of the hard work. Yeah, you kind of have to earn your right to get on bad, is, is, is what he's saying. In the real world, mm -hmm. you have to earn the right to get on bad. So you, you, you work hard and you play hard. And there's something for the right. public to see and enjoy and, and, and say, okay, you know what? They're behaving bad, but mm -hmm. look at the beauty that they're bringing to yeah. us as well. So you always have the light and the dark next to each other. And we have a call. That's the nature of life. Good evening. Uh, Tim, good evening to you. And, uh, good, good evening to you, Mr. Roger. Good evening, good evening to you, sir. Let me tell you, Tim. I'm sorry. You don't think it's a high time. It's, it's a penalizing band for coming on here too late. So, can I tell you, all after seven, a band is being judged on stage. I'll be sure, I mean, can I mention the best of the good time? Can I just come on here all after seven, go on stage, only in darkness, you can't see no, no creativity. No color. No, 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 no. So, Mr. Roger, since you, I mean, I know you're going to be a ploy, eh? <laughs> uh? No, I don't think it's I don't think it is. I think bands want to, want to cross the stage and get on with it. Um, let me tell you. Is that the extent of your contribution, Arthur? Yeah, no, right. Yes, man. Okay, okay. Then. All right, thanks a lot. Right. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you. We have issues managing the parade. The issues have existed for a long time. We're hoping that in this new conversation with Events and Lucia, and CDF and other stakeholders um, vitally must include the police and, and traffic and so forth, that we will actually be able to solve some of those problems together. It is not the intention of any band, I don't think, to delay the progress of the parade and to arrive in town later than the, 
than they want, than, than the public thinks mm -hmm. reasonable. Most bands, I think, want to actually get to the stage, turn around, and go back up the highway and get to a nice, long, easy jump. So what's the reason then for the, for the delay? I think the par parade management ha has not been rationally addressed. It has not been rationally addressed. And there's some for silly so little... Yes, for so mm -hmm. long. Um, it, 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 it gets addressed, and then we, we, we make a gain, and then we lose it the next year because we forget or we didn't do it. When you consider that it took us probably an hour to get from the stage to right round to the market because telephone wires were hanging too low and cars were parked on Lower Darling Road. So we moved the stage for one reason and we, we hope that that improves the situation. But then going round the corner, the whole thing falls apart. Um, we need to get all the heads together in one room very early over a series of meetings and try and work these things out and then recognize that while the bands are available before the carnival to do all the rational planning, on the day we are focused on our revelers and we are responsible to them. And so somebody else has to take over the, 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 the management and the stage management and the parade management aspects of it. We are then the performers. We are not the producers at that point. We are the performers. We have a call. Good evening. Uh, hi, Tim. Hi, good evening to you, sir. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. I, I want to um, paint a picture yes. of an experience I had with Carnival back in, I must have been about four or five at the time, if I remember the place where I, where I experienced it. Um, and this picture has always stuck in my mind. And when I see productions like your 12, it reminds me of what Carnival is about. Now, even in those days, I am sure there were the extreme performers who did what was extreme for the day. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, I don't remember them at all. Well, I remember standing at the intersection of Chisel Street and um, Jeremy Street, watching, I think it was Turk's band coming down that road. It was like about 6 o'clock. It was like a semi gloom kind of afternoon. Yes. And I remember vividly the, 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 the um, scene of the of the costume was something to do with, it was a gloomy subject like death or mm -hmm. graves or some such mm -hmm. thing. But you have the pan beating this, this pulsating rhythm. The street was jammed with people. The costumes were made of, of a lot of um, thin foil and all sorts of muscular things and crosses and weaponry. And there was this, this it, it was almost... Um, it was the sort of thing I connect with, the sort of feeling one gets when one is in a mass crowd event where people are hypnotized in what is going on, and they've lost touch with reality. And this thing is moving down slowly, people are charming, people are enjoying themselves. And whenever I think of mass carnival, this is what I remember. Mm -hmm. Now, your band of 12 seems maybe to drift away from the gloominess of what they were portraying for the day, but it reminds me of that kind of thing, and this is what I call mass. We will always find the people on the, on, on the, on the edges of it, the periphery, dealing with what they deal in, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the flashy stuff mm -hmm. that's flashy for the day. But 50 years from now, nobody will remember that. They will remember the performance you had this year. Yes. And what I would wish is that people would try to come in with more of the big band stuff, <laughs> you know, um, the, the portrayal, the things that have a theme, the things that have a play. And, um, and I think that kind of carnival we could sell easily. This year, they all have some nice stuff. I mean, I'm not bothered about the crazy stuff we saw, because like I said, it'll come and go. But I'm always, I always, whenever I see a good mask like yours, I remember that day. And I'm talking mm -hmm. like going back over, over 60, <laughs> I'm yes. sorry, Pete, over mm -hmm. 60 years, I remember mm -hmm. that. About 60 years. Yeah. And I'm sure I remember 12 a long time from now. But I have to, I have to say, because mm -hmm. your, your mask is a good one. Let's try to keep it up. Now I'm having an argument with my wife here. And if you know me, he knows me, so he can tell who it is. How much did your costume cost you? Which, what, the big king of the band's costume? Yes. Well, I haven't added it all up yet. <laughs> um, <laughs> but a lot. It's, it's, well, first of all, let me tell you, the material costs for these things are not cheap. I mean, probably for that costume, anywhere from 10, 15, and up, $1,000. Mm -hmm. um, but hats off to the people who come and help to make the mass, which is really where the value is in so many ways, mm -hmm. um, because we have a team of people who come in and help to make the mass, and that is really where the value is. 
Um, if, if you were to actually cost it, it would be far beyond what you're thinking, huh? Yes. If you wanted uh -huh. if you wanted somebody to build that costume for you outside of San Lucia, I think you'd be looking at twenty five thousand US dollars easily. Right. So that's the figure yeah. I was talking. She right. wouldn't believe when she sees you, she'll tell you. But, but we don't deal with yeah. We don't deal in reality when we build know, these things. We deal with, 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 with love and creativity I and and camaraderie and, and a kind of unity that just makes a mass happen. Right. Um, That's what I was trying to explain to yeah. some people like you. And we don't pay ourselves either. I, I right. want people to know that yeah. Um, yeah. the people who make the mass, we don't put a cent in our pockets. Um, yeah. we, we pay our bills. We, we give something to the people who support us. Yeah. And um, we put a little bit aside for next year and we start again. Yeah. This, is, yeah. this is not... Um, I, I don't know. I think it's part of the discussion that we have to have. But <clears throat> if it's possible to make masks for both love and money, mm -hmm. um, in my 40 years experience, I have found that it's either one or the other. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the two don't lie down well together. Yeah, yeah great job. Man. Yeah. All right, sir. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Let's take the final comments from you, um, Adrian. Um, final comments. Um, well, I'm going to speak as a mass man first. Mm -hmm. The... I love Carnival, and I hope it shows. And I love the fact that there is a group of us who get together and have decided that mass is what we love, and what we love is mass. And we make the mass we play, and we play the mass we love. And, and this, is, this is it. Um, as I said earlier, I'm not sure that you can make mass for both money and love at the same time. Um, we have we have decided to go with the love part, and it shows. Um, there are some people moaning about about um, Tribe of Twelve winning, um, and you know the sort of postmenopausal complaints that have been on Facebook. That's not my problem. Um, you want to be twelve, try and come second or third, and then you can have that conversation. You're not in that cockfight, honestly. When you come in sixth, seventh, and eighth, it means you have not even tried enough to be in that debate. So bring yourself up, and then you will start to, to be credible in your argument about who should win and who should not win. Um, the judges, I think, are doing a good job. And it needs to be said that there is a completely objective and transparent process. And the people who are shouting the loudest know this very well. There, you cannot become a judge unless you are trained. You cannot become a judge unless you are voted for by the entire cross-section of the Carnival Bands Association. So there is a ranking process. And if you, are con if you are deemed to be a bad judge, you will find yourself at the bottom of the ranking. And that ranking comes from the entire community of bands who are eligible members in the in the of the Carnival Bands Association. So 12 has absolutely no influence over the judging process. These are not our friends, these are not our colleagues, these are not our First Communion buddies. The thing is objective, and I think most rational people know that, and they should stop deceiving themselves and the public to suggest that there is something wrong with the judging. I think it's an insult to the people who come out and give up their time voluntarily to look at a lot of rather mundane stuff sometimes um, give the judges something to excite them give them something that they can look to and say i i see where the value is also people need to acquaint themselves with the judging criteria and see what the judges are rewarding portrayal theme workmanship presentation these are the things that we have decided that we want to do well, and we continue to compete with ourselves um, to try and do better every year. So um, read my article, Oak, also. I wrote last year. It was published, Oh, Victory, Where is Your Mercy? Uh, we do not enjoy the fact that other people are not um, being rewarded. We have argued for other people to be rewarded in the competition, and we would very much like to see that. We're on record as being willing to teach anybody who wants to come. But don't keep giving the judges the same mundane stuff and expect them to be excited by your portrayal. Um, that's not what the competition is about. If you want to do what you want to do, then proceed. But don't moan when you find yourself far away from the criteria that is being rewarded. Um, as a citizen, I would like to see our festival grow. It has tremendous potential, and I would like us to get all our stakeholders together and work out our differences 
and let us have the best carnival that St. Lucia can have. We have a fantastic um, uh, potential. We have a wonderful carnival. Um, we can focus on the negativity or we can focus on the strengths. Um, I'm available to be part of the solution. I would like to think that we collectively are part of the solution. Um, but we also have to take individual responsibility for ourselves and our actions and our behavior and stop waiting for the government to do everything. I mean, enough with that cop out. Adrian, thank you so much for being my guest on this thank evening's News Nicolai. And to you, thank you so much for watching and thank you for contributing via your calls. If it's Wednesday, it's News Make a Live time now for the clip. That beat. We had some error that was not supposed to be the clip that picked, so we apologize to you. And fortunately, um, one of my technical people did put the wrong clip into our folder. So we apologize for that. We do not have a clip that peak for this evening. Hopefully, we'll have one next week, Wednesday. My name is Timothy Paul. You're saying good night and see you next time. Maybe we can show try what's going on. <laughs>